please turn your Bibles to Revelation 11.11 as we continue in our study in a very difficult book to understand and and, uh, admittedly so and uh, we left off last week with the two witnesses two prophetic witnesses of God that most commentators see are beamed down from a time in the past men that were living in the past taken up into heaven, Elijah, Enoch, Moses is the second one, and they're sent down to earth for a three and a half year mission to be prophets in Jerusalem, and the world hates them. They're unable to be killed or otherwise stopped. (laughs) The world can't cancel culture them. They can't silence them because they're somehow able to communicate and be protected miraculously by God, but the whole world's going to hate their message except for the few that end up fearing God because they're, they're prophesying judgment at a time that judgment of God is coming with the seven trumpet judgments that are coming down upon the earth. And during that time, they're going to say, hey, next judgment, next judgment, because you guys are rebelling against God. You're killing uh, people that fear, um, you know, come to Jesus during the tribulation period called tribulation saints. And so the world hates them. And last week we saw that ultimately the Antichrist somehow gets power. And today we're going to find out in chapter 12 because Satan is kicked out of heaven. He comes down, possesses the Antichrist. And with that extra power, he's allowed by God to kill the witnesses. And that will deceive the world to realize, hey, this Antichrist killed these witnesses that were prophets of God. And so he's got the power. I'm going to put my... I'm going to put my bet on the Antichrist that he's going to win. But that's a bad bet because it's God that allowed that that, uh, death of of the two people that are sitting, their bodies are allowed to rot in the city for three and a half days. Their plan is to just let them rot. But then they raise from the grave and they go, oh, Maybe God is more powerful because he rose these people from the grave. Isn't that the awesome power of God demonstrated with Jesus? Jesus rose from the grave. He rose us from the grave too because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And now when we're forgiven, we have the ability to be resurrected. That's what baptism is symbolic of. I want to die to my old life, and now I'm coming with a new life of Jesus living inside of me, giving me that life because I have faith in him. So... Three and a half days later, they raised from the grave, and we covered this last week. And, so, and this event of them resurrecting sets off rejoicing in heaven. And even though it's three and a half years until Jesus actually comes back, but something happens that makes the earth all of a sudden, you know, the, the inhabitants in heaven, as soon as they see this event, which is the mid-tribulation, what is it that makes them rejoice this week or next week, we'll be emphasizing when we get there in Revelation 12, that what it is is Satan truly is defeated. There's an angelic battle between Michael and the angels of God and Satan and his angels, and it's a heavy-duty battle. But Michael uh, prevails, and Satan is cast down to the earth, and and he knows he only has a short time left. He's done. The game's over. And so then all heaven rejoices. It's it. It's done. Uh, God has, by his power and the angels that he's ordained to have the power, has kicked this Satan who God has used for the last 6,000 years. He's used Satan. To what? To give people an option. You want to serve him or you want to serve God? It allows us to have the option of whether we want to love God or whether we want to love Satan. Whether we can love God unto everlasting life or you want to love Satan into everlasting death. And because God is a loving God, he lets us decide whether we want to be married to him or not. And if we want to be married to God, he says, okay, except it's, it's my house. I get to rule. My laws rule. And that means you have to repent and say that you want me to be the Lord of your life. And you, you don't want to rebel against my authority, which Adam and Eve did when they were deceived by Satan in the garden. And, and what I did, and I hope all of you did, is go, how could I rebel against you? You're the creator of the universe. Uh, Forgive me for for the years I did. Forgive me for the years I was deceived into rebelling and coming against you when you are a good God. And then all of a sudden, he goes, oh, okay, repent it, changed attitude, want to 
be forgiven for the sins you've already committed against me and the sins you're going to commit because you're, a, because you're just dust, because <laughs> you're just a, a human being that's going to fail, and you're gonna, but you're going to run to me and you're going to say, God, you're right, I'm wrong, forgive me again. And he goes, okay, we got a relationship. Now we have a relationship and you're going to come into my family. You're going to come into heaven forever. And so then, you know, that's what the believers do. The followers of Satan go, I want to sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, pedophilia, um, drugs, and just perversion, and usurping power however I can, take power, steal, whatever it takes to get to the top. And they get their buzzes doing all that, and it ends in death. And they're going to answer to the God who truly did create the heavens and the earth, and said, no, you, you can't murder, you can't steal, you're not supposed to commit adultery, you're not this, and all that. And if you want to rebel against that and say, I can do whatever I want to do, then you're not fit for heaven. You want to go to the king of the pit. And so everybody gets to be happy. The people that wanted to serve the king of the pit, they get to go to the king of the pit with him. Only, only they're enjoying a little bit of the kingdom of God here because God has still blessed this planet with his presence. And uh, they're just not going to... It's going to be foolish to make a wrong decision. Revelation 11.11. 11. Now, after three and a half days of being dead in the street, the breath of life from God entered them. They stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Now, why do you think they had great fear? Well, uh, they're watching. <laughs> the whole world's partying. God loses. Antichrist wins. These prophets lose. Antichrist wins. And then they, then they see it, as I said before. And I would imagine, don't know for sure, but what, when the Antichrist and the global kingdom that he's going to rule over takes over the world, what do you think they're going to do to Bibles? You know, they're going to do what Nazi Germany did. And what the Russians did, they're going to get rid of the Bibles. And, and that's another thing I'd encourage you to do is to have a Bible hiding place. When I built our house, I actually <laughs> made a place to be able to hide Bibles should the time occur. And <clears throat> so have a place to hide your Bible. But I bet you there's going to be people that are aware of what the Bible says about these witnesses. And so when these witnesses are prophesying, there's going to be people that are going to say, I remember I went to a church service once in Port Orchard, and this guy was saying that there was going to be two witnesses, and there's two witnesses. And, there, and nobody's going to be able to stop them. If, they, if somebody tries to kill them, then they're going to be able to call fire down from heaven and consume them, and that's what they're doing. And then when, they, and then when the people of the Antichrist, the ones serving the Antichrist, wanting to party and glad these guys are finally dead, <laughs> See, your witnesses, they're dead. Yeah, the Bible talks about that too. And the Bible says three and a half days later. So there's going to be people, my guess. They're going to be sitting there, okay, three and a half days. And, and when it happens, they're going to go, okay. Wow, the Bible's true. And it's going to put fear in some of them to repent, we're going to see in the text today. And others, see, a lot of people have fear and they don't respond to it. Do, do you think there was some fear in the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees when they um, told Pilate, we need to seal the tomb because you know what this guy said is that he's going to be able to raise from the grave. And then when the, when the soldiers of the temple soldiers came to the scribes and Pharisees and said, look, the earth shook and we were watching that, <laughs> that tomb and all of a sudden the stone rolled away and the tomb is empty and when the scribes and the Pharisees paid him off to go lie to everybody about the resurrection, do you think there was a little bit of fear in them, though, because Jesus was, they knew, they knew he was alive? Absolutely, they had fear too. But they didn't respond to the fear in a way of submission to God. They just doubled down. Do, do you think there's fear in, in the deep state today that, oh, the Pope got arrested, if that's true? Um, and the Italian police arrested him and... Trump has the goods on us because WikiLeaks just also dumped a bunch of stuff today about all the pedophiles and everything that are in our government and Podesta, the former campaign manager of Hillary and a bunch of stuff about that. Do you think they're in fear? Of course. Are they going to repent? No. <laughs> they're going to double down. They're going to do whatever they can to silence 
anybody that exposes, try and stop this, no matter what it takes, assassinating people and everything else. And see, that's the way the world is. And most of the world is that way. Most of the world refuses to submit to the sovereign love of God. They refuse to give up their life and say, you know what, you got me dead to rights, I need to cry out for the forgiveness of God. And that could, that could be true for a pedophile. It could be true for a, a, a liar, a stealer, anybody, an adulterer, anybody can cry, upon the, cry out to God. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. And, but they don't want to. Because they think they can hold on there till the end and somehow win. Um, so, and then referring to this timeline that I put together, the tribulation period, uh, 70th week of Daniel, which there's a bunch of handouts on the back table, but it's also up there. Hopefully you can, that's the right one, and you can read that. It's the December 28th version. Um, I just want to emphasize where we're at in this timeline, for those, especially those that might be just joining us. The first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation, which started when an Antichrist made a covenant with many for one seven-year period of time, the six trumpet, you know, trumpets one through six are blowing. The 144,000 witnesses from the 12 tribes of Israel probably also beam down to earth, as crazy as that sounds, that's what the Bible leads you to believe. And they're witnessing and telling people, because the church is gone. Why did God do it? The church gets taken, you and I get taken, before the tribulation starts. And God leaves his witness, though. He always wants people to know the truth. When, you know, with this cancel culture in the shutting down today, yesterday, all the social media news, isn't it going to be kind of crazy when you can't get any news? And especially if you can't get any news that tells the truth about what's happening. And so if the church is gone, which the church is supposed to have been for 2,000 years, the bastion of truth, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his word. Has it succeeded in that mission? No. I mean, there's always been a remnant of church that truly teach the Bible the way God penned it to be understood. But it's been deviated from because Satan infiltrates the church. Would it be, if there is a war going on between God and Satan, would it be, Logical to assume that Satan has infiltrated the church to try and get every single doctrine of demon into the church, which really the apostles and prophets said that's what he's going to do. In the last days, there's going to be doctrines of demons that come into the church. And so God put 144,000 witnesses and then these two prophet witnesses in Jerusalem for the sake of people being able to know the truth, which they will reject as the truth, just like the deep state rejects the fact that there was fraud in the election even though that is the truth, but they reject that because they're lovers of the lie rather than lovers of the truth. So, uh, then the, and so what we're at today is the blue line that's vertical. That's the middle of the tribulation. And so many things are happening here that there's parenthetical statements going on. We're going to see in chapter 12, there's a war in heaven. Satan gets cast to the earth that I alluded to earlier. Satan is going to possess the Antichrist, and, it, and he's going to put a stop to temple worship in Jerusalem and the rebuilt temple that's still yet future. The Antichrist is going to go into that temple and declare himself to be God. The Antichrist is going to be killed but comes alive. So he's going to say, okay, those witnesses, they came alive, but so did I. It's going to be by the power of Satan, apparently, that he comes alive. We'll catch this when we get to chapter 13. Uh, he will kill the two witnesses, and, and he could have killed the two witnesses earlier. I mean, this sequence of events is just one way, uh, because it's all happening in short sequence. It could have been, you know, the, the sequence on some of these could be just a little bit different um, and be what's going to actually happen, because it's very short periods of time for this. And some Jews are going to realize the Antichrist has deceived them, obeyed Jesus, and we're going to cover this today, by fleeing to the wilderness. So once again, when they see these two witnesses die and then resurrect, realizing Jesus spoke of that event, spoke of the event, how the Antichrist is going to deceive them to be the Messiah, allowing them to build their temple. But three and a half years into it, he's going to say, okay, no more temple worship. I'm securing all Jewish sacrifice. I'm going to declare myself to be God, go into the temple and declare that I am God. And anybody who doesn't worship me as God is going to be killed. Then some Jews are going to say, 
we bet on the wrong horse. And we were deceived, just like prophet Jesus, true Messiah, told us 2,000 years ago in Matthew 25, 4. Matthew 24, he said, don't believe that there's messiahs. Don't listen to when they give you a report that the messiah has come. Because when I come back, it's going to be like the lightning shines from the east to the west. Nobody's going to have to wonder whether the Antichrist is the messiah. You're going to know because I'm coming with power and great glory from heaven itself. Well, the Jews are not going to believe Jesus until this event happens. And some of them are going to have a fear that brings them to repentance, to follow Jesus, their true Messiah, and they're going to do what Jesus told them to do, and they're going to run to the wilderness. And we'll cover that. And so Antichrist goes on a killing rampage against the Jews and tribulation saints that did not flee to the wilderness. And, um, and again, the two witnesses coming to life could happen before that. I mean, it's, again, all this stuff is happening within days. Um, and, then, and then the seventh trumpet blows, and the seventh trumpet, as you see on the right side of your timeline, the seventh trumpet actually lights off the seven bulls of wrath judgment that happens in the last three and a half years. But we don't read about that till we get to chapter 16. And so there's still parenthetical information that's happening here. Chapter 13 is more about the Antichrist, marking everybody, forcing everybody to be marked. Uh, and you have chapter 14, how... Uh, there's angels flying around giving the witness now to the earth because they're flying around the world giving the witness of the true gospel of Jesus because now the church is gone, the 144,000 are gone, the two witnesses are gone. There still has to be a message. There has to be still parlor. <laughs> now, there has to be God's version of parlor that can't be shut down by the Antichrist. And so he's going to do that in chapter 14. So there's still parenthetical stuff that we're trying to get through here. And... Uh, verse 13 again of Revelation 11. The rest were afraid and gave glory to God of heaven. Did you, I hope everybody here got to that point of being afraid. You know, I rejected God, as I've told you before, as a young man, deceived into various different false ideas that Satan polluted my mind with through people that were his emissaries believed in reincarnation, believed in just being a pagan, believed that God didn't exist, but hating him anyway. <laughs> How do you hate somebody you don't think exists? Um, you know, I'm used to do that. Uh, you know, even believing and thinking as I was being foolish and just you know, riding my motorcycle drunk, see you in hell if I die, you know, if I go out and kill myself and just tell my friends, see you in hell a place I didn't believe exists from reincarnation. So yeah, I was so confused. And then when I realized this Jesus actually came to forgive me and he's and he's willing he's willing to do so even though i've been such an enemy of his um it put fear in me because i realized if we fight god we can't be with him and he's the good god that created the heavens and the earth and he says and if you fight me you go to hell because that's where there's no me you don't like me hell is where there's no me and then I realized, that's not a good deal. And I've been really a fool. And so then, got on my knees, and he changed me. So some, once again, when they see this, this is going to be a huge day in Jerusalem. It's going to be a huge day when these people resurrect. And some people are going to say, I am done with the Antichrist. And right after that, the Antichrist says, okay, now you need to take my name in your hand or in my forehead and worship the image of my presence or I'll have your head chopped off. And these people that said, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God, they're going to say, do your best. <laughs> I don't care. I have had the fear of God. I'm worshiping Jesus as my Savior, and I don't care what you do to my temporary body. And they'll be killed, according to other scriptures we've already covered in Revelation. So 11, uh, 11 14, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So actually, 11.14 is reminding us of the second woe that was several verses ago, uh, chapter 9. So let's go back to chapter 8 of Revelation 8.13. Just to remind what's being said here, there was, before the warning about three woes, there was, uh, there was four of the seven trumpet judgments. 
The first one was striking the earth's vegetation. The second one is striking the sea. The third one was striking the fresh water. And the fourth trumpet blast was striking um, the sun and the moon. And so there's going to be cataclysmic, you know, environmental kind of disasters happening with the trumpet blast. And then 8.13 says, And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Now, the, what has the woe been? What are the trumpet blasts? The wrath of God. So when it's saying, woe to all the inhabitants of the earth, because you've already experienced four trumpet blasts, but you're about to get three more. And the three more are, woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth. Now, can the church be here for that? No, can't be here, because 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says, that God will not allow the church to see the wrath of God. Because of the remaining blast of the trumpet, God's judgment on the, of the three angels who are about to sound. Well, the first woe was the fifth trumpet, which brought tormenting locusts to the earth that stung people for five months that they wished they were dead, but they couldn't. And the second woe was the sixth trumpet, which was a demonic horde of horsemen that killed a third of the world's population, which after a fourth had already been killed, that leaves a half of the world's population, or four billion people dead, if by today's, we're close to eight billion people, say. So four billion people dead on the earth at this point. And there's still another woe, and the woe is the seventh trumpet, which brings the seven bowls of wrath. And so, going back to Revelation 11 14, keeping... Um, you know, the context here of what's being said, the second woe is past, which was the sixth trumpet, the demonic horde of horsemen. Uh, second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Well, yeah, like the next verse. <laughs> then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven. Loud voices, I think, of, you know, angels, people in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world have the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, once again, the seventh trumpet blows at the middle of the tribulation period. When does Jesus come? Three and a half years later, at the end of the tribulation period. But the people are rejoicing right here. And it's not just here. I mean, it keeps going on with people rejoicing. Why? Once again, because chapter 12 deals with the war in heaven and Satan is kicked out at the middle. And so when Satan is not even allowed to come home, <laughs> he was kicked out as an angel of God when he fell after creation. And, and, but he's still allowed to go up there and accuse, according to the Bible, he goes up there and says, hey, you seen Kevin? You know, he believes in you, but look at how he still sins and this and that and Whatever he's not, you know, why did you die for him? Well, because he loves me and he's, not, he's still under construction. And uh, he's not finished yet. We got that all worked out at the resurrection. He's going to get a new body. Uh, he's going to be set free from the effects of sin that he inherited from Adam and Eve. And he's going to be mine. And that's the way it is. His name's written in the book of life. So, but he still goes up there and he accuses all of you that are truly born again and, and see what they say in chapter 12 is that finally the accuser of our brethren has been, boom, gotten rid of. Isn't it nice that he doesn't get to visit us in heaven every once in a while to say, hey, I'm the bad guy that messed up the world and deceived all those people. He's not ever allowed into heaven again. And we get to go there and he's gone. Well, see, they know, <laughs> see, the people already there are going, wow, this is it. You know, it's kind of like when... It's kind of like in football, you know, there's the other side's all out of timeouts and it's, you know, the two minute warning is over and you, you've got the ball. You know they lose, you know, they, they lose, you got the ball because they haven't got any more timeouts. It's not over yet, but you know, and that's technically what's happening here. They know what's happening and they're rejoicing. And 11:16, and the 24 elders which we covered in detail in chapters 4 and 5. This is representative of the church, or they are church members, the 24 that were chosen to be the special 
elders in the eternal kingdom, who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces, and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. You said, Enough's enough. And you told Michael the archangel, um, which is not Jesus, by the way. Um, he's an archangel. He's not Jesus. Jesus is God. Michael is an angel. Um, and he said, Michael, okay, it's time. Kick him out. And he says, okay. And they fought. Now, I, I don't know if we get to see how that goes. It, I've never seen angels fight, but I would imagine it's pretty gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what the Bible does lead us to understand is the enemy, Satan, is a very powerful creature. He has great power to deceive. He deceived a third of the angels. We're going to find out in chapter 12. And led him, ast led him astray and is able to do uh, miraculous things. We saw in the book of Job, he was able to cause a fire to just come down and consume Job's family. He was able to stir up people to cause war, to take, out, to take away all of Job's herds and his, and his servants. Uh, he's a powerful enemy. But God is more powerful. You have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged. This is talking about the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. You know, if you die without trusting in Jesus as your Savior, then, then this is what it's talking about. Because if you die with faith in Jesus, you're already alive at this point. But if you die without Jesus, your Savior, you go to the holding place of the dead. And then after the eternal kingdom is getting ready to be set up, the thousand-year reign of Jesus is over, all the dead people, they get called up before God, and he goes, okay, you didn't want Jesus, you didn't want to be forgiven for your sins, you thought you were a good person, so here, let's see what kind of a good person you are. And it's a WikiLeaks file on everything you've ever done. Ever, ever, ever done? Right, would, you, would you want your WikiLeaks file that had any, everything you've ever, ever, ever done released no. to the media? No. <laughs> it's going to be released to God. Now, see, smart people sit there and go, could you please eternally delete my file? That's what you mean to delete your file? Yes, but you have to change your heart towards me. You have to agree that those were all sins you committed against me. You have to agree that I'm right and you're wrong. Okay, I'll do that because your laws are good. I, I don't want people to steal from me. I didn't mind stealing from other people back when I was a pagan. But, you know, all these laws are good. And you're a good God. And so then he wipes your record clean. And in exchange, you become his slave. Paul calls it bond slave, meaning a willing slave. Are you a willing slave? I want to be a slave to the God and the creator of the universe who, not, who only cares about my good. I want to be his slave. So, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come for the time of the dead that they should be judged. But if they don't have Jesus, they, you know, God opens, it says in Revelation 20, opens up, oh, your book's not in the book of life. You didn't ever bow the knee to my Jesus. So here it is. You thought you were good, but you're not. So you're going to go with Satan down into hell because you're not you're not cleaned up for heaven. You're going to muddy up the place if you weren't washed clean of your sin. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. Now, I want to be in that group. Wouldn't you want to be rewarded by the God who created the heavens and the earth? And those who fear your name, small and great. <laughs> Where do we get to go? Forever with God in heaven. And why are the nations angry? They just don't get to do their own thing. They want to do their own thing. The scribes and Pharisees, we just want to rule the way we want to rule. And this Jesus is telling us that, we, that he's the Messiah and that we have to listen to him. We like it. We, we've got power. People listen to us. They're, they're impressed with us when we give long prayers. And they like our garb. They like our stuff that we have on. And they look to us as spiritual leaders. We like that. We, why should we share that with Jesus? Well, because Jesus is God in flesh. 
that you should reward your servants of prophets, saying, so those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. The, the, the angels and the saints in heaven are going, finally, you're putting an end to those that are destroying the earth. The, don't we sit in amazement that the deep state, with their, all the efforts they put into in the last four years to get ready to make sure the election never allowed a nationalist to get in again, after their depression about Hillary not getting in, how they put all this amazing, amazing plan together to what? Destroy this country. Their plan is to destroy it, to turn it into a communist country. And they can look around and say, how, how good was communism for China and for the Soviet Union and for Cambodia? And Oh, it was terrible. I mean, tens of millions of people died. Oh, well, that's good. Let's do that. And see, that's what the, the world in rebellion... See, God created the heavens and the earth, and what did he say when he got all done? It's good. This is good. Satan came in and corrupted it by deceiving us human beings, Adam and Eve, who listened to him instead of God, made their choice of, I'm going to take what God told me not to take, and I'm going to eat of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, which is going to make me think I can be God. You know, there's people that think they can go be God. So they, they're still listening to Satan. They think that they can go be God. And, and so that corrupted the world. And what Jesus is going to do is going to say, it was my world. I made it for human beings. Most have decided they want to follow Satan in the corrupted world. But I've promised, through the prophets, Jesus crucified before the foundations of the earth, that though I am going to restore it back to the way I intended for those who have lovingly decided to opt out of the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and thinking I can go be God, I'm going I'm to opt back into the creation that God had intended in the beginning. I don't see it now, but it's promised to me by the prophets. And so then what the angels are saying, good, you're getting rid of them before Satan destroys the entire world. If Satan were unrestrained, he would have gotten people to kill each other to where there's no human beings left. That's what it says in the Bible. And then he goes, see, I win. I killed them all. <laughs> and what, and aren't you glad that God keeps him from doing that? But his judgment has to fall upon this earth for it to happen. And the judgment's going to be severe. But the angels are saying, it's okay, it's okay. Whatever it takes to drain the swamp, we want to have the garden back. Let's go to John chapter 12, verse 20. I know it's not in your notes. Hopefully you have your Bibles. Some people have thought that I'm contributing to your biblical ignorance by giving you notes that have it all there so you don't have to open your Bible. So this is the one time I get to repent of that sin, should it be such, and get you to open your Bible. John chapter 12, verse 28. New Testament. <laughs> Just trying to be kind. <laughs> Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now, I want to emphasize this. Can, G can the Father say to the Son, I'm going to glorify your name if Jesus is not God? No. Because he says in Isaiah that God will not share his glory with another. Of course I've glorified it because you are the exact representation of me. Because you are. It was we in the garden that said, let us make man in our image. It was us in the garden that, so in the beginning God, Elohim, who means a, a plural unity, created the heavens and the earth. Both glorified and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Another said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sakes. He goes, I know who I am. <laughs> you know, I know I'm going to be glorified. I, I know I'm, I'm going to complete my mission and be glorified with the Father. But he said that for you so that you could know. Now, now is the judgment of this world. Now, the ruler of this world will be cast out. When does that happen? Revelation chapter 12, if we ever get there. And so, future to us. See, and then and he goes, and I, 
if I am lifted up from the earth, what's he talking about? Being crucified. If I finish the plan that I'm here to do, I came into the world to save sinners. I came into the world to lay down my perfect life, take their sin, and give them my perfection if they bow their knee and worship me as their Savior. And, and so if I be lifted up, finish the job of going to the cross on their behalf, I will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. See, he was calling people to himself. That's why we worship Jesus. He is our Savior. It's why in Jesus' name we know that we have everlasting life. There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we can be saved. It means God's salvation plan. You know, Jesus, Yahshua, means God's salvation. So, uh, so why, the question is, you know, going back to Revelation eleven eighteen, why did he wait so long? <laughs> you know, he, he's saying he is going to glorify, I am going to go to the cross. Well, why didn't he kick Satan out right after the cross? because there wasn't anybody saved, because there was no church. There was because his plan is to load up heaven with people who are exposed to this corrupted, fallen world and say, you know what? I don't like it. I don't like the dog-eat-dog. I don't like the theft, the violence. I don't like, I, I tried drugs, alcohol, and I just realized it just gives me an empty life. It just makes me wonder, this can't be what it's about. I, I've lived for myself and abused others, sometimes purposely and other times just because I'm a jerk. And I just couldn't help but, but affect people. And I just, God, there's something seriously wrong. I want you. I want you to fix me. I want you to make me right again. And then when he does, we go, wow, he's inside of me. He's changed me. And aren't we glad he waited at least, for me, 1974. I was glad he waited that long. Put your date in there. Aren't you glad he waited, waited, waited? And that his creation and the offspring thereof have been given a chance, again, to tap back in to his world through the cross. And when we do that, we know we have a hope of everlasting life. And he's waiting, but his wait is almost over. You can tell by the changes in this world. We're entering into the foothills of the tribulation period. And when the tribulation period get tri really gets going, you know, with the war that leads to a fourth of the world's population dying, if I'm correct in my understanding, then we're going to be gone. And, and the world is setting up for this. There's people saying that there's Chinese up in the Canadian and, and Mexico ready to invade to help the deep state corrupt this country and take over. I don't know if that's true, but let me give you one, one thing I learned in China. Ni hao. That means hello. It's a nice... You know, it's like a greeting. So when they, if the troops do come, there's a chance they won't kill you if you go, ni hao, and then, and then have some, and then have some uh, uh, good Chinese food in your house, and they might decide to leave you and spare you, but the, but the people with the intel are saying they're planning on coming in and slaughtering to take America because they need more land and food resources because they're running out in China. So, but in either case, should that scare us? No, because all it does is it be, ni hao, oh, you know Chinese, not any more than that, that's all I know, oh, <laughs> boom. <laughs> you know? here, here, and they'll say as I'm bleeding out, and this is how you say goodbye. <laughs> Verse 19. Then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. What makes Revelation so difficult is you read that verse, where does that fit in in the middle? It doesn't. It goes to the end. This is, if you read Revelation 16, 17 through 21, you'll see that it is a parallel to the very end. So, so what's happening is Jesus, you're, you have kicked Satan out and you have begun to reign and you are going to destroy those who destroy the earth. And it jumps three and a half years later in verse 19 and says, because we see how it ends too. And it ends exactly, Revelation 16, 17, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl of wrath into the air and a loud voice came out of heaven, uh, the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. 
and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake. Isn't that what verse 19 of chapter 11 says? So they're, they're parallel verses. So you have to use the Bible to interpret the Bible to unravel our mind's complexities of seeing the timing of what's happening here. It's not just sequential. And now let's read the first six verses of chapter 12. Because now we're going back to this war in heaven. We're going back to um, laying the parenthetical background. Only this parenthetical chapter, chapter 12, starts out at creation and goes all the way to the end of the tribulation. So it's parenthetical, though, to give us an understanding of what's happening in the middle of the tribulation. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was, the, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her 300, uh, feed her there. 1,260 days, which is three and a half years, the last three and a half years. So that, that timing lets us know this is the middle of the tribulation, and whoever's being hidden away in the wilderness lasts for three and a half years until Jesus comes back. So let's go back to verse, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, last week I told you to uh, read about Joseph and his dreams. How many did that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars now I was going to say one of you that read it and had never heard us teach this before I want you to tell me who this is but since nobody read it and therefore can't do it you know, most people that read Revelation and they haven't read the rest of the Bible, they'll say, who is this? And they'll, they'll come up with whatever they want to say. We've said this so many times through Revelation. Revelation, more than any other book of the Bible, quotes other sections of the Bible. And without reading the whole Bible, you can't understand Revelation. And so let's turn to Genesis 37, 9, and we will know who is being talked about. We will know who this woman is. And we don't have to conjecture about who it is. So the history of Genesis is, you know, God ultimately has Abraham as a chosen, he's chosen Abraham to be his witness. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. The 11th son was Joseph. Joseph is the one that his brothers couldn't stand, just like how the world was angry at God. His brothers were angry at Joseph. Why? Because Joseph loved God, and Joseph loved his dad, and Joseph didn't want to party like the sons did, and they wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to kill him. And, but Joseph has these dreams because he's so in love with God, and God gave him the gift of being able to have dreams, and he dreamed in verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream, told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brother. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother, I'm going to say the moon, and I, the sun, and your brothers, the eleven, of the twelve tribes of Israel, because he's the twelfth, right? So it has to be the eleven, the brothers of Joseph, indeed come to bow down to the earth before you, and his brothers envied him, meaning they wanted, you know, they, they envied like, oh, 
you know, little punk kids saying that we're going to someday bow down to you. And, but his father kept the matter in mind because his father loved Jesus too. His father loved God. And he said, what if this is true? What if my son has actually received a, a dream from God and someday I'm going to come and bow down to him? Well, if you read the rest of the chapters of this story, they all do. It all gets fulfilled. Because he goes off to Egypt, they sell him into slavery into Egypt, and he becomes second to Pharaoh. And because of another dream, Egypt stores up grain for seven good years, and then the seven famished years, everybody's dying, and, and uh, Jacob sends his sons to go get some wheat from Egypt because we hear there's wheat in Egypt somehow because of his son that he didn't even know. And they go bowing down to him, thinking he's an Egyptian, when in fact it's his brother, their brother's. Uh, you know, the brother's brother. So it all comes true. So now let's go back to Revelation 12.1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So does that ring a bell? Uh, completely. Oh, Kevin, no, no, because Joseph's dream was 11, and this one's 12, so this isn't Israel. Oh, well, he's the 12th. See, in this, in this vision, he has to be the 12th to be all of Israel. So what is the woman? It's the Jews. It's the Jewish people. Then being with child, she, the nation of Israel, cried out in labor and pain to give birth for, you know, for 1,500 years, basically. Abraham is about or Abraham was about 2,000 years. He was promised that a seed is going to come as a descendant of yours. And then you have the law being given around 1500 B.C. with Moses and the promises of the Messiah there. And then you have it 1,000 years B.C. David is told it's going to be through you that the Messiah is going to come. And then so another 1,000 years is waited. And so Israel, the Jews who stay around despite the insurmountable odds even in their days, they give birth to Jesus. Now Mary gave birth to Jesus, but... It was the Jewish nation, the promises to the Jewish nation by which he came. Um, and we know it's Jesus, right? How do we know it's Jesus? Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Well, because verse 5 says she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Who's that? That's Jesus. So it's talking about the Jewish nation is going to be used by God to bring about the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. How do we know who he is? Well, verse 7 says it's Satan. Having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. We have plenty of other verses as the same terminology we'll cover later to explain that. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down, threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who do you think that is? What do you think that is? Herod the Great. So what does this mean? Satan was inside of Herod the Great. He was possessed by Satan himself to say, where is that Jewish Messiah that's supposed to be born according to the prophets of Daniel and everybody else and the timing is right and it should be here and as I've said before, he, even though he was an old man just weeks away from dying, um, he sits there and goes, I got to kill this Jesus. And that was Satan because if he kills Jesus, what happens? He doesn't become the savior of the world. And he, and he somehow dementedly thinks he can get away with usurping the plans of God. And so, but how do we know his tail drew a third of the stars? This is how we knew Satan, this verse tells us, implies strongly, that Satan, when he fell from heaven, um, decided to rebel against God, that he took a third of the angels with him. How come stars? Well, Job 38 says, where were you when, when God is now rebuking Job for having an attitude about being messed with? Uh, short, short version. <laughs> um, where were you? you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its foundations fastened? Who laid its cornerstone? He's basically saying, and this is a, a statement to us too, God, why did you fill in the blank? 
why did you let this happen? You know, the one, my favorite one. Why did you let my neck rupture a disc and go paralyzed? You know, and where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? I thought you said I'm your Lord. You, you, you said I could do with you what I want to do. And if I know it's going to work in your life for some greater good, then what's your problem? You know, that's kind of what God's attitude is. And we shouldn't we be that way? You know, it's like, I'll let God be God. And I'm going to trust him. Because it says in your word, it says, all things work out together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, I signed up in 1974. I love you. And you've called me to your purposes, and I'm your slave. You're, I'm your bond slave, so it's okay what happens, because he's God. And, uh, and then it says in Job, uh, and then it goes on to say, verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So at creation, Satan and the angels are rejoicing at the creation of the universe. And then, it says in Isaiah and Ezekiel, that Satan got puffed up because God gave them free will too. God gave the angels free will. And Satan got puffed up and said, yeah, he made me kind of a, I'm a big boy angel up here and I'm going to take advantage and I think I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to take on dad. How many of you as kids felt like you could take on dad? Same kind of attitude that I did. <laughs> My brother did too. He led me. <laughs> Uh, that's a really bad decision in life, is to take on dad. But that's what Satan did. And going back to Revelation 12, 4, he drew a third of the stars of the heaven and threw them to the earth. So a third of the angels became the demons. Some people say, well, no, demons are different than fallen angels. I, I don't know. They're bad. I don't like them, and they're going to go to the lake of fire along with Satan someday. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born, but didn't happen because God protected Jesus. She bore a male child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. When was that? At the ascension. Where he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the time that God says, okay, come down to earth. Remember, I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe, whenever it was, I said, you know, God's going to keep his church here to spread his message as long as we can. When we can't, because we can't, <laughs> or because nobody wants to listen, then he's going to take us home. And you know, the part of he, we can't is happening in front of our eyes this week. Can, can you imagine? I, I never used to write a letter, but I write hundreds of emails in a week. I mean, read and write a hundred, uh, you know, whatever. Lots. Can you imagine sticking stamps again? And, you know, writing out an address and trusting the mail. By the way, in China, you don't send mail and have it be secure, right? Because, phew, what are these people saying? So nothing can be secure. Nothing, of, if they shut down, could they shut down your email? They can't, that's my... <laughs> and the New World Order guys are going to say, you fool. You think we can't shut that down? You think we can't shut down calvarypo.org? You think, and, and imagine in this day and age where your phone is turned off, your email's turned off, your website's turned off, your ability to access anything that's alternate media, where the only, you know, hey, uh, news for today, Pravda, American style, comes up on your phone and you get to listen to the lies of the New World Order. And then you try and communicate Jesus to somebody. And that's already put out in the news. Those crazy. Somebody was telling me that they're at Costco. And the, the lady at the checkout struck up a conversation. And she goes, you know, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a lover of Jesus. And, and then she goes, oh, praise God, I am too. And then that Costco lady, that checkout lady, yelled over at another sister and said, hey, we got another believer in Jesus here. <laughs> Now, how many other hallelujah, praise God's do you think emanated out of the crowd? How, how much disgust was there probably there? The day's coming where, like in China, you don't do that. You don't say Jesus. Unless you know somebody and you're trying to reach out to them, they shut it down, and they're shutting down here too. And so why I'm emphasizing 
that means we're close to going home because the church, the true church, has done its job. The world is getting ready to clamp down, and they're going to effectively, they've taken over the style of communication in the last 20 years to make it so that they can then flip the switch and stop it and then control the narrative as the world marches on to the kingdom of the Antichrist. So I hope you're all ready to go home because it looks like we're soon to do so. And then the woman, verse 6, fled into the wilderness. Well, this is 2,000 years later. This, see, verse 5 is he ascended 2,000 years ago. Verse 6 is future to us. And we'll pick it up there next week. I was actually thinking today, I know there's no way to get through this whole chapter, and I said if it was just like days in, the, in Paul, where he could just preach all night long if he wanted to, <laughs> but we have Sunday school kids downstairs and everything else, and we do have next week, but it, it really should have all been taught all in one line, so try and hold on to this at this point for when we come back next week, if we're allowed to meet, and... If not, just, uh, let's just trust Jesus until he comes. I want to emphasize closing. It's good to fear God, and it's good to act on that fear by putting our faith and trust in his son Jesus. Because God the Father is going to ask that question, what did you do with Jesus? And there's just one answer that works. I bowed the knee, confessed my sins, worshipped him as my Savior, that he alone shed his blood on the cross so that I could be forgiven. It's not religion. It's not churches. It's not membership. It's not anything else. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And with that answer, you are given citizenship in heaven and everlasting life. Any other answer is you're siding with Satan, and you're going to get Satan's reward in Satan's world at the end. Let nobody here be deceived into taking the wrong path because it's eternal consequences uh, when it comes down to Judgment Day. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus, that you so loved us, you sent him so that we could tap out of this corrupted world. And God, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, I pray that in their hearts, as it being just a heart thing, God, you want our hearts. You want us to just surrender to you, to allow you to do heart surgery, to confess our need for you as a Savior. That, Lord, you would just, in their time, that you would touch them, that you would convict them with your Holy Spirit like you did me. That it's time to make a decision before it's too late to truly, humbly come to you. We thank you, God, for your patience with us. We're thankful that you've been long-suffering with your, with your human creation who have fought you for thousands of years, and yet you put up with that because of the remnant. The few that come out of the midst of this corrupted world to say, God, forgive me, and I want to serve you and love you and be part of your kingdom when you come. And we thank you for that mercy upon us and your long-suffering and grace and and pray that you would just help us in these last days to keep preaching your word until you take us home, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God in this song. Gloria is your name in all the earth. Ooh, your glory is, yeah. Is your name in all the earth. Yeah.